Welcome everyone. We're just gonna wait for folks to join. So feel free to just hang tight for a moment while we, while we um, wait for the attendees to, to join us. Hi everyone, um, welcome here today. I know there might still be some folks who are going to join us, but um, I just wanna be respectful of everybody's time and, and use the max time that we have. So um, I just wanted to welcome everyone here um, and I'm glad that you signed up for this webinar today. Um, I first just wanted to, you know, do, do a little bit of welcome introductions. So my name is Anna Anazu, and I work in the ISSS office. And I'm here with my colleagues, Christine and Tyler, who also work in the ISSS office. So we'll be um, here on the chat and helping facilitate things as they move along. And um, before getting into some just logistical information, I, I wanted to introduce Kristen Knudsen um, and I'll, I'll let her introduce herself. But as you can see, she's here to talk about employment-based immigration options following graduation. Um, Kristen, do you wanna say anything? Hi, my name is Kristen Knudsen. I'm a private immigration attorney that I focus on employment-based options, but I also handle basically all types of immigration cases. 
So family-based, humanitarian, asylum, temporary protected status, and a removal defense. So I'm able to handle a lot of the questions you may have about employment-based as well as other options today. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, we're so grateful to have you here and have your expertise and knowledge shared. So um, thank you again. Um, so this webinar is um, being recorded as um, you may have seen in the chat. And so it will be available on the OIA Office of International Affairs ISSS website um, after, after today. And um, we have the next one and a half hour with each other. So this is scheduled to end by 1.30. Um, Kristen's organized her presentation so that she can address certain topics um, at a time and then, you know, have a pause for questions as needed. Um, and then potentially having some time at the end for questions. Um, so we'll ask that you as participants, if you do have a question, to please use the Q&A function on um, on the Zoom and ISSS staff will be able to either answer that directly, either answering you via chat or we'll, we'll ask Kristen those questions live depending on um, you know, what might be the best, best way to direct those. Um, so I think that that might be it for now and we can go ahead and get started, um, but take it, take it away, Kristen. Thanks, and I just wanted to thank uh, CU and Anna and Asu, uh, Tyler, Christine. Thank you all for having me and for helping organize this today. This is my second time speaking to students at CU. I really had a great time last time, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions today. Um, some of them may be more appropriate for ISSS to answer, and that's why we have several people present that can help you with those specific questions. Um, that are more appropriate for them to answer. Um, so it's an exciting time for you all to be thinking about um, the next steps. Um, maybe you just started school and you're getting a start early so you can think about your path to permanent residency in the United States or to remain here for a period of time to work in the US. Um, so it's a great, it's great if you're getting started early um, or maybe you're looking at graduating sometime soon. Um, and if that's the case, we're going to be addressing what you should be thinking about now and after graduation and in the years to come. Um, as Anna mentioned, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat. And if they're relevant to the section we're talking about, I will stop to address those as we go. So let me make sure we're moving forward in the presentation here. All right. So the most common, we're going to be addressing the most common path after graduation. Um, and that is typically the OPT, Optional Practical Training and STEM OPT for science, technology, engineering and math students. Um, that allows one to three years of temporary status after graduation. Um, and then moving on to an H-1B, which is for professional workers in specialty occupations. Um, that requires a bachelor's degree. So it's one of the most common things that we see. Um, and from there, Many times an employer is willing to file an employment based petition for permanent residency. So that's the pathway that we see most of the time. And so I'm going to spend a significant amount of time addressing those types of status. However, we will also address some other immigration options today because I want you to be thinking more creatively. The H-1B is, is not a guaranteed pathway. Um, there's a limited number. So we have to think about other options. If, if you really want to remain in the United States, uh, what other options exist? Uh, those options may depend on where you're from, your family ties in the United States, whether you have money to invest in the United States, um, whether you're, there are some humanitarian reasons for you to remain here. And it's good to think about those things early. Sometimes we can start those pathways even while you're going to school. So we're gonna talk about um, self petitions like e visas, uh, other temporary options, uh, permanent resident self petitions if you don't have an employer to petition for you or you have the option to do it yourself um, based on your degree and the type of work you'll, you'll be doing and other 
humanitarian and family options today. Um, there are temporary visas, A through V basically, um, and each visa is, has specific requirements for it. There are some that are way more common and so those are the ones we're going to be addressing. Um, but those allow you to come to the US for a particular purpose for a specific period of time. Um, there are also very, a number of pathways, a number of pathways to immigration for immigration to actually immigrate to the United States, which means you're planning to move here permanently. Um, so I'm gonna move on, but I wanted you to, to make sure that you understood the difference between non-immigrants, which is the temporary and immigrant. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about essentially non-immigrant moving into immigrant. Okay, as students, you are typically here on temporary student visas. Um, Okay, so one of the things I wanted to note before we move on is that it's really essential to get advice that's specific to your case. So um, the university, ISSS, has a ton of information available um, with really knowledgeable attorneys on staff. And so I think that that's a great place to start. Certainly attending this presentation is a great way to get general information about your case. But your immigration options need to be tailored to your specific circumstances. Um, it's important that you're speaking at any time you're trying to get advice about your particular situation. You want to talk to an, a licensed immigration lawyer um, and not a notario. Notarios have little offices set up um, a lot of times along federal or there are a lot of them in Aurora. These are, they may be attorneys in other countries, um, but they are not attorneys here. And I've seen many, many harmful things done by notarios, sometimes intentionally and sometimes with good intentions behind it, but they cause lots of problems for your case. Immigration law is very, um, it's very complicated. And so you want both the person to be knowledgeable and specialized in the area of immigration if they're going to be helping you. And you want them to be able to be held accountable um, if they mess something up. <laughs> um, and that tends to make them a little bit more careful. So you wanna to speak to a real immigration lawyer. Um, you wanna watch for, uh, if you're relying on the attorney of your employer, you wanna make sure that you understand whether the attorney that you're, you're talking to actually represents you. So you can ask the attorney directly, hey, are, do you actually represent me or do you just represent the employer? Um, if, if you found the attorney and brought the employer to that attorney, then the attorney should also represent your interest. It's called a dual representation. If they only represent the employer, they may not be sharing all of the information with you. And so you need to understand what, what that advice is going to look like. They may not tell you what you need to do in particular, or if you tell them something about criminal history, they're going to share it with the employer. So in certain situations, the attorney may only represent the employer, prospective employer, you may wanna get your own lawyer as well. Um, and very important not to only rely on your friend's situations. I see this all the time. Well, my friend you know, got his residency by doing this and that can really blow up in your face if it's not your particular situation as well. Um, an example of this, um, maybe you're here as a student um, and uh, in the past you had a J-1 visa as an exchange student um, or another type of J-1 and there's a two year foreign residency requirement attached to it. You're not gonna be able to get an H-1B after graduation because you're prevented from doing so. So you were able to get the student visa but you're not gonna be able to move on to H-1B. Well, maybe your friend who never came with a J-1 with a two-year foreign residency requirement is able to just follow the traditional path and get an H-1B. So it's really important to understand your particular situation. The other thing I wanted to know is to watch for status violations. One of the most common ones is you're working without permission in the United States, okay? Um, maybe you're a nanny in the US and you're not supposed to be working because you don't have that authorization um, or you're working in an area that is not the area that's tied to your degree 
And so you're not really doing what you're supposed to be doing. Get advice sooner rather than later. Many times we can fix those small immigration status violations, but if you're filling out a form and you feel like you have to lie um, and you're doing it yourself, you feel like you have to lie to get it approved, those misrepresentations can cause problems and actually permanently prevent you from gaining like your green card in the United States. So stop, take a step back, go talk to an attorney and see if whatever you've done can be fixed. Okay, so we're gonna move on to post-completion optional practical training. So this is work authorization that is valid for a year following graduation at each higher education level. Um, so this is something that many of you, if you have F1 student status, should be eligible for when you complete your, when you complete your programs. Um, the work has to be directly related to the course of study. Um, you do have to apply for employment authorization and get an employment authorization document, which I think is important. There is also curriculum practical training, which you don't need an actual work authorization card for. OPT, you do need work authorization for. Um, but it's very broad in that you can work, um, you can start your own business with OPT. It can be self-employment. You can work for a traditional employer. You can work at least 20 hours a week, but it can be part-time. It could be unpaid or volunteer work as long it's related, as it's related to your degree. It could be a consulting arrangement and not a traditional employment arrangement. All of those things are acceptable for OPT or may be acceptable for OPT. Um, so you, like I said, you have to have an employment authorization card. Um, you can have up to 90 days of unemployment. You get a 60 day grace period when you complete your OPT. So that means you've completed a full year of optional practical training and you get another 60 days to figure out what you want to do. Or if you're unemployed for a period of time, you'll get the 60 day grace period, which will give you time to change your status to another type of temporary status um, where you're still legally in the United States. It gives you a period of time where you um, aren't, you know, accruing unlawful presence. You aren't here illegally. Um, and it's really important uh, when you're doing optional practical training, you're gonna still be working, working with ISSS. You have to update your I-20s with any change of employment, any change in your arrangements. So the certain timing considerations are really important for OPT. They're pretty strict at uh, US Citizenship and Immigration Services, the immigration agency that will be reviewing these applications. If you mess up the timing, you may just be denied and that might be the end of it. Um, you won't have time necessarily to appeal the decision or to reopen the decision uh, before, like during that 60 day grace period. So you wanna make sure things are done correctly. ISSS has lots of great materials on OPT. I know they've successfully helped a lot of people do this. You can work through a private attorney as well to prepare the applications. Um, USCIS has to receive the application for employment authorization within the 90 days prior to your program ending and 60 days after, and within 30 days of DSO at your school, updating CVIS with the OPT recommendation, okay? If you, if you fail to do that, it may be denied. Um, the 12 months of OPT must be completed within 14 months after the program completion. So typically if you wait too long to apply, we wait till after graduation, you may end up with a shorter period of time um, than the full 12 months of OPT. So you wanna do this early, make sure that you're prepared. Um, at the same time with COVID, there have been a lot of delays at USCIS. And so one of the accommodations that USCIS has made recently um, they've said it's taking us longer to process these applications than normal. So when we approve your OPT, we should give you the full 12 months, even if it wouldn't, that end date will, will fall outside of the 14 months, as long as you timely filed. Um, so you should be getting a full 12 months of OPT. And if you're not, you can request that USCIS correct that error. 
Okay, and then we want to talk about cap gap. Um, and that's something that's an essentially an accommodation or a policy that USCIS has made um, if you are going to apply for an H-1B. So if your OPT ends on April 1st or after, um, that's typically the first day that you could apply for an H-1B. Um, so the, the, if you file that H-1B application and your OPT expires after that, it will automatically extend your OPT um, until you get a decision on the H-1B. Um, and that could be all the way through September 30th. And essentially it would fill that blank space where your OPT is expired and you're waiting to start work on an H-1B uh, with work authorization. Okay, and we're gonna talk more about the process um, you now have to register for H-1Bs and get selected in the lottery. Um, so that's one of the things that you take a look at. Um, the timing on when you start your OPT and when you end your OPT can determine whether you're going to be eligible for cap gap. Um, there are still, so I talked about it ending in you know, after April 1st can make you eligible for cap gap. There's still some benefits to graduating in January, for example. Um, one of the main ones that I've seen is that it gives you time to work with an employer on OPT before the employer would be required to register for the H-1B lottery. So if they're not sure if they're gonna like you enough to spend the money on an H-1B for you, Giving, you know, getting a few months of work in with them before that H-1B period may, you know, push them over, nudge them over. So there's still some benefits to graduating in January, but your OPT is going to expire in a year in January, which means that you wouldn't be eligible for cap gap. Um, so it is something to think about when you're when you're planning your graduation, planning your courses at the university. All right, so STEM OPT provides an additional 24 months of work authorization um, in if you have a degree in a STEM field. Okay, so if you graduated science, technology, education, and math, and those are codes determined by the university um, and designated by USCIS, um, then you get an additional up to two years of work authorization. The STEM OPT has a lot more um, requirements associated with it. It's narrower than regular OPT. Um, so you actually do need an employer employee relationship to work on STEM OPT, meaning you can't do self-employment. A contracting arrangement may not work for this. Um, the employer has to uh, sign up for E-Verify and use E-Verify, which is a government program to verify work authorization. Um, the employer, you and the employer have to complete a training program and submit that. You have to check in with um, USCIS. Um, there's a 20 hour a week minimum. So you do have to work and you have to be paid. Um, and your salary needs to be commensurate with US workers. That's something the employer has to guarantee here. So if you were volunteering on OPT, you can't just continue doing that for STEM OPT. Um, one thing to note is, you know, if you graduated with an MBA, for example, um, so you've got your master's, you do OPT, but your undergraduate degree, your bachelor's degree was in a STEM field, you could still be eligible for STEM OPT following your OPT based on that prior degree. Okay, so there's timing considerations for STEM OPT as well. You must apply prior to the expiration of your optional practical training. Um, you can have up to 150 total days of unemployment. If you exceed that, then you would be starting your grace period, essentially. You're, not, you're no longer able to continue working. Um, you need six month check-ins, as I mentioned, with a DSO, and there's a 60 day grace period following your STEM OPT. Okay, so let's talk about the H-1B. The H-1B 
is for individuals in professional occupations. That means an occupation that typically requires a bachelor's degree. And it, the bachelor's degree must be related to, um, to the position that you're going to be filling. Um, H-1Bs are completely employer sponsored. You can't file for yourself. Um, they grant you, if it's approved, three years of temporary status that can be extended to six. And there's ways to extend it beyond six in certain situations. Um, H-1Bs are great in that they're considered dual intent. Um, dual intent means that immigration officials, um, when you're applying for H-1B visas to travel to the US um, or applying or within the United States, they're not going to be looking at whether you ultimately want to live in the United States or whether you still have ties to your home abroad. Um, in applying for a student visa, you had to prove that you have ties to your home and that you're planning on going back and that you're not going to remain in the US permanently. H-1Bs, they don't even look at that. So that's wonderful because you can truly be planning to make a life in the United States with an H-1B. Um, so when we talk about H-1Bs, we are actually within the registration period right now um, for the CAP lottery. Um, so the cap is a limit that Congress placed on the number of H-1Bs for a given year. The regular cap is 65,000 uh, individuals and the master's cap provides an additional 20,000 visas. Um, and typically in a given year, there have been 200,000 plus applications for those positions. You know, that's been consistent over the past several years. We'll have to see what this year holds. I'm finding in my own practice that it's definitely slower this year. So if you're able to apply this year, maybe, maybe my, if my experience is consistent with what it's going to look like, there will be less applications and a greater chance of getting selected. Um, you're subject to the cap if you're working for the majority of employers, okay? So um, let's see, private employers, many nonprofits, and government positions typically are subject to this limit. Um, cap exempt employers include institutions of higher education, so universities, um, related institutions, and there's a technical legal definition for that, um, nonprofit research organizations, okay, and some government research organizations. So, in short, if you're applying for a CAP subject position, then you have to be prepared to apply as early as possible. Essentially, your employer has to register you in March for the lottery, um, and you would then have a period of time in which you could apply. The employer is going to petition for you um, following that. Um, and the earliest you could start working on an H-1B is October 1st of a given year. Um, if it's cap exempt, there's no limit. So at any point you get a job offer from a cap exempt institution, you can, they can file a petition for you and you can start working when that is approved. Um, so it's really nice to work at a cap exempt institution, um, but many of them are not. <laughs> so um, there are very limited H-1Bs compared with demand, as I mentioned. Um, it's, although it's historically the most common pathway for students uh, following graduation, you may want to look at other options. Um, even if your employer agrees to sponsor you for an H-1B, you may want to say, all right, well, let me take a step back. What happens if I don't get selected in the lottery this year? You know, do I still have OPT? Do I have STEM OPT? Um, you know, or should I look at some of the other options that we're going to talk about later on? Um, all right, so the CAP selection process, as I mentioned, um, requires registration. It started yesterday, actually, at noon. Um, it's a $10 registration fee. Your employer has to register you, and that registration period ends on March 25th. 
So if you're working for an employer or you have an employer interested in you and you've completed your bachelor's degree or maybe you've completed master's degree or a doctorate, now is the time for this year. If it's CAP subject, after March 25th, you're unlikely to have an opportunity to apply for this year. Um, so uh, you may want to look at uh, improving your chances. We can talk about ways to improve your chances in the lottery, especially if you're attending this presentation early on um, or avoiding the cap altogether. Um, so as I mentioned, you can look at cap exempt institutions for work. Um, or if you work, you're allowed to work with an, for an H-1B if you work at two different organizations. If one of them is cap exempt, then the other one is also included in that. So you would be able to work at both institutions because one of them is cap exempt. Um, and so you could apply at any time if you have that awesome situation going. Um, improving your chances, you want to apply early and often. So if you have a, a job offer this year and you qualify for an H-1B in terms of having your degree and the, the positions in your field, then you wanna see if you can apply this year. Um, you don't have to wait until your OPT is going to expire to apply for an H-1B. Um, if you apply early and you apply in the very first year you have your, your OPT, then you may get the opportunity to register for the lottery again next year while you're still in the United States. If you know you're gonna get three years with the STEM OPT, you still want to apply early and often as long as you've got employers willing to file for you. Um, you can get a master's degree because that improves your chances quite a bit. Um, there's an additional 20,000. You're still eligible for the 65,000. The lottery has been switched up a little bit to give people with master's degree a preference. So master's degrees do typically have more like a one in three chance of getting selected where people with just bachelor's degrees, and these are US master's degrees, okay? Not any master's degree. A master's degree or higher from a US um, nonprofit public institution. Um, all right, so that improves your chances. Um, you wanna look for an established employer, okay? The employer has to have been in business for at least a year um, so you don't want to look at a startup necessarily that's brand, brand new to file an H-1B for you. Um, you also want to look for employers that have, um, the possibility of helping you going forward. So that means that they're willing to petition for you later on, um, for your permanent residency. Um, so that's a conversation that you can have with HR when you start. Maybe if you've been working on OPT for them for a while, you're gonna feel more comfortable asking. So that's where establishing that relationship early with the employer can be really important. Sometimes you can establish that relationship if you're eligible for curriculum practical training, CPT, and then moving on to OPT. Um, so other considerations when you're looking at positions um, and I realize that you don't always have lots of options. There may be one employer that's interested in you and they agree to do the H-1B and that's it. But if you have a couple of options, you wanna think about the position title and description. Um, you want it to essentially match up well with a federal database that says, these types of positions require bachelor's degrees and specialized degree in a particular field. So one of the examples that I like to use is like a software engineering position typically requires a bachelor's degree um, in software engineering or a very closely related field. Um, I have a lot of success with software engineers, for example. Um, but if you've got a liberal arts degree and you're looking at a position, uh, you know, uh, working in communications, for example, it may not be closely tied with your degree and that communications field may not be one that is you know, specialized enough that requires a particular degree. If the position says you just need a bachelor's degree in anything, you're not gonna have success probably with USCIS. 
Um, so worksite location, it's easier to get an H-1B if you are working on site. Uh, with COVID, what we're seeing is most people are working from home um, and work from home telework arrangements are fine as long as they're handled correctly through the H-1B process. Um, but if you're being contracted out and the person or the entity that's petitioning for you is not going to have control over the day-to-day -day work, um, they're just hiring you so that they can contract you out and they're not really not really the employer in the situation, you're gonna have a hard time with your H-1B petition. So you wanna try to stay away of those, from those types of employers that are just looking to contract you out. Your H-1B may end up being denied um, because it's difficult to get the documentation needed and to prove the employer-employee relationship um, that's required. So looking at company stability, how long have they been around? Uh, how's their financial situation? The wage offered, um, there's, there's been a lot of flux in this area right now, but typically if they're offering you, they have to offer you enough money to meet the minimum federal requirement. They have to be willing to pay the, the prevailing wage, which is in a federal database. That's something that an attorney can help you find. Um, or, you know, sometimes they're in-house attorneys at the employer that handle immigration but the company needs to be willing to pay that prevailing wage. Um, but a lot of times if you're filling a higher level position at the company where you have some authority over managing other people, managing other professionals, that also shows that it's a more specialized position requiring um, a higher level of education that helps define a specialty occupation. Um, you want to look at whether the HR person, whether it's specifically an HR person or it's the, you know, the CEO of the company, whether they're responsive to you and whether they're willing to answer your questions. Do they understand? Have they ever worked with anyone who has had an H-1B in the past? Are they willing to, are you able to pin them down to say, yes, we'll sponsor you? Um, if you're not getting answers to those questions, you know, and the registration period is coming up, it may not be the best bet for you. As I mentioned earlier, you're, you may also want to pin them down on, okay, if you get me an H-1B, um, are you willing to then sponsor me um, a few years down the road for my residency? Um, and, you know, one of the backups to H-1B may be, are you willing to be, sponsor me right now for my residency? Um, since H-1B is a lottery situation for many people. So you wanna make sure that HR is responsive, answering your questions, seems to understand what is going on or they're willing to talk to an attorney to find out what's going on, um, willing to file the registration and keep you informed. All right, so your role in the H-1B process as I mentioned, this is not a self petition. You're not the person filing the documentation. You don't get to register yourself for the H-1B lottery. The employer has to do that. So you will be asked though to file or to provide the documentation and show that you've maintained your lawful immigration status in the US. Um, you're gonna have to provide your, your credentials for your degree, proof that you've completed your degree, or that you've completed all the requirements for your degree before you apply for that H-1B or before it's filed for you. You're gonna ask, be asked for biographical information. You'll need to, my, my recommendation is to make sure you understand the process so you can follow up on deadlines with your employer. Um, and if, you under, if the attorney that is preparing the H-1B represents both of you, you can certainly be more involved in the process of following up with the attorney on deadlines and how things are going. Um, you may decide you wanna pay for premium processing of an H-1B. So if you get selected in the lottery, you file your application, you pay an additional fee. It's now pretty high, it's $2,500. But maybe you wanna file that premium processing fee to get a decision more quickly. Um, it, you get a decision within 15 business days or at least correspondence saying they need more evidence. Um, 
you may have to post a notice that's required in the H-1B process in your own home if you're going to be working from home. So for a lot of people that 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 may apply at this point. Um, and if you have a spouse or children that are dependent on you currently, then you're going to need to make sure that you file a change of status application for your spouse and children. So if your H-1B is included, they also become H-4 dependents. If you don't do that, then they may fall out of status as soon as you become an H-1B employee. Um, so sometimes that's handled by the same attorney, uh, especially if it's a dual representation situation. And sometimes you need to get your own um, attorney to handle that. It's not your role to make final decisions on the position description or the requirements for the position. Um, you're not allowed to sign the petition for the company and you wouldn't want to because you don't want to be that involved in the process. Um, you can't pay for your own H-1B petition by law. So if the company is asking you to pay for the petition or reimburse them for the petition, that's illegal and it could get you and the company in trouble. So you wanna be on, be on the lookout for companies that are asking you to do that. Um, you are allowed, I mentioned premium processing, you can pay for premium processing, but you can't pay the attorney's fees for the H-1B and you can't pay the filing fees for the H-1B forms. Um, and you wanna understand your status and the implications of the process that you're going through. So I think that it's very important, even if someone else is handling the petition or the employer says, we're taking care of this for you, you still wanna know what you're doing. If it doesn't work out for some reason, you wanna know when you should be getting answers and follow up um, because your status in the US is ultimately your responsibility. Um, so it can be a little bit daunting when it feels like it's out of your hands. Just make sure that you're educated, get your own attorney if you need it to understand what's going on um, and do your own research. Okay, so if you get your H-1B approved, you're supposed to be provided with a copy of the labor condition application that provides the locations of employment and other terms that the, or that the employer is required to follow. They should give that to you. You wanna keep your I-94 document that you receive from the government. It's, uh, it provides the dates that you're authorized to stay in the US as an H-1B. Um, if you're planning on leaving the United States, you're going to need to get an H-1B visa. Sometimes that's handled by the attorney that filed the H-1B and sometimes it is not. So the actual visa may be something that you, you need to take responsibility for or find your own attorney for. The, the, when I talk about visas, I'm talking about the travel document that goes in your passport, the document that you receive when you go to a US embassy or US consulate abroad and go to an interview, um, that's where they issue the visas. When you apply for an H-1B within the United States, um, they don't give you the visa, so you can't return to the U.S. as an H-1B based on the documentation that you've been provided, unless you're Canadian, because you don't need a visa if you're Canadian for most categories. Um, you'll have to take those approvals and essentially apply for the visa abroad. So you'll be an H-1B status, possibly in the United States, but not have an H-1B visa. Um, so it's your responsibility to make sure you have the documentation to travel back to the US once you've been granted H-1B status. And then if you decide to change jobs, um, another company can file an H-1B petition for you then if you've already been um, you know, selected in the, in the lottery process, you can do what's called porting from one position to another. Um, and so that's something that another company can do and you would just give your company notice at the point that you are have been approved for the new position um, or you may be brave and decide to leave as soon as the other company files that petition for you. Um, so those are things that, that you want to be informed about and make sure you understand um, so that you maintain your status at all times in the United States. Other possible outcomes of filing an H-1B, you could get a request for evidence, RFE. 
Um, and that's a document where the government asks the company for more evidence. Sometimes it's evidence of your degree, so you may be more involved in that. Um, other times it's evidence, you know, that the company is going to provide sufficient supervision at one of the work sites, for example, um, or that the position qualifies as a specialty occupation. Um, so if you get an RFE, it's certainly not over, but the company needs to respond in a timely fashion um, and provide a thorough response to make sure that you have the best chance of getting approved as possible. Uh, the H-1B could also be denied. And if that's the case, then you'll have to look at your backup plans. You know, are you still on OPT? Could you try again? Was it the company's mistake? Was the position not qualifying? You have to do a, an assessment of why it was denied and where does that leave me? Do I still have legal status in the US or do I need to look at leaving the United States? And sometimes you need um, to go, maybe the H-1B petition is approved, but they don't grant you a change in status. Um, the change in status is where you would be, go from being a student, for example, and then on, on October 1st, you're allowed to immediately start working as an H-1B in the United States. Um, sometimes you have to travel, get the H-1B visa and return to the U.S. Um, one of those situations, maybe if you did violate the terms of your student status, then I would advise you as an attorney to um, depending on the violation, we may say, okay, let's not apply for a change of status. Let's apply for essentially consular notification. So the H-1B gets approved and then you need to leave the U.S., which in some cases will cancel out that violation. And then you can come back to the United States as an H-1B with an H-1B visa. Um, so sometimes it's not a change of status. You need to get the visa and return to the U.S. Okay, so you've got, maybe you've got your H-1B or maybe you, you don't. Um, the employer's not excited about the idea of a lottery um, and instead is willing to sponsor you for employment-based petitions. Now, most of the time these are employer sponsored, but they don't have to be. There's a couple of categories that allow you to petition for yourself. Um, most people just getting out of school, whether it be your bachelor's, master's, or doctorate, um, you may not be eligible for an EB-1 extraordinary ability petition. Um, but I'm still gonna talk about it a little bit just in case. Um, so the goal of an employment-based petition is permanent residency, your green card, okay? Um, we've got the EB-1 extraordinary ability. There's different classifications, EB-1, EB-2, EB-3, employment-based, first preference, second preference, and third preference. Each of these groups has a different number of visas allocated. Um, and so, and we're gonna look at the visa bulletin in a minute. Um, but EB-1 includes individuals with extraordinary ability outstanding professors and researchers and multinational managers. EB2 is exceptional ability or individuals who have at least a master's degree or the equivalent. So that would be a bachelor's degree plus five years of experience in the field. And EB3 is for professional workers. So if you have your bachelor's degree, uh, you would qualify for EB3. And then there are other um, other workers that also fall into essentially the EB3 category as well. So if you look the way that this is broken down currently, this is called a visa bulletin. These are published every month. Um, and uh, you can see that there's employment-based categories, uh, first, second, and third. Um, are the ones that we typically discuss since we're looking at bachelor's degrees plus. Um, and you can see that certain countries are broken out here on the chart. So if you're from China, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, India, Mexico, and typically the Philippines, um, I don't think we captured the whole chart here. Um, then there, there are so many people applying from those countries that they've been broken out. Um, so they have a separate column on the chart. 
Um, if you have a petition filed for you in the um, in the third preference because you have a bachelor's degree, then you want to match that up with your country where you were born, and that will tell you whether there are visas available based on the date that the petition was filed. Um, so you can see that on this particular chart, um, if you're from anywhere other than China, uh, India, and probably the Philippines, then you have current priority dates. C means current. So you could file in this month um, your application for residence. So um, this is based on where you're born, not where you're a citizen. So maybe you're a citizen of more than one country, um, but they're going to look at where you were born. Um, if you have a spouse who was, let's say you're from China, so you're looking at having to wait longer for certain types of visas. If your spouse is from New Zealand, um, then you actually get to benefit from your spouse's country of chargeability when you apply for your green card and you would have a current priority date. So those are some of the little tricks. Um, this changes every month. Um, if you wanna know whether there are visas available, um, you can take a look at this. You just Google visa bulletin and make sure you're looking at the visa bulletin online on the Department of State's website. Um, and they, they get published from the mid to the end of the month, um, each month for the following month, okay? Um, this can also help you determine some strategy. Um, a lot of people are really anxious to get into second preference, for example, instead of third preference. Um, you can see, for example, if you're from India, that if you um, are in third preference, that it's actually, you can file if you filed in 2010, the petition was filed in 2010 or before, but the second preference you had to have filed in 2009. So, you know, it used to be that you wanted to get into that second preference category for a better priority date, but so many people from India are second preference that you may be better off in third. Um, also, a lot of times first press first preference, extraordinary ability, or outstanding researcher, that category many times is current. So you may want to apply in that category if you're eligible for it. But anyway, these things do change every month. So you can try to strategize based on the visa bulletin, but it may change on you. Some of the proposals that we've seen in Congress have been to get rid of the, the categories or the country per capita uh, or the country allocations, per country allocations. So that would kind of revamp the visa bulletin altogether. Um, none of that has been passed yet, so I, I can't really advise on that at this point, but just understand that there's a possibility that change would go through and it would primarily benefit Indians and Chinese who have long backlogs at this point, um, if it does go through. All right, so we've got uh, the PERM process is uh, the main process that you have to go through. It, the idea with the PERM process is that the employer has to do a test of the labor market to see if, um, to see if there are any available and willing and qualified US workers to fill the position before the government's willing to say, okay, we'll certify this position as an open position with no US workers. Now a foreign national can fill that position. Um, so most people go through the PERM process. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about first. The prevailing wage determination request is the first thing the employer has to do. Um, they're gonna define the position and all of the requirements and the government will then come back and say, that's great. We think this is a level three position based on the description and you need to pay this worker a minimum of $110,000 a year, for example, okay? If the employer is willing to pay that as a minimum, then your case can move on to the second stage. Uh, that would be recruitment. So that's where the employer actually has to post the position that you're trying to fill, right? Um, in various locations. And it's gonna depend on the level of education required. Most of the time, 
when I'm talking to CU students, we're talking about professional positions. So they're gonna have to advertise in Sunday paper. Um, they're gonna have to advertise in three other places and they're going to have to post notice of the position. And then the company is gonna have to go through the process of actually interviewing uh, people for the position. All right, so, oops, sorry, went down. Um, if all of that goes well, then you try to get the PERM certified. That means that we're saying there was no qualified applicant, so we're gonna move forward, try to get it certified for you to fill the position. That would be by filing um, the PERM labor certification online. And then at the I-140 stage, the company tries to get you qualified for the position by sending in your credentials. Once that's approved, um, you can file your application for residency. Or if you have a current visa, you may be able to do the I-140 and the I-485 at the same time. So again, your role is to provide the documentation, the credentials. Um, you may have to, you wanna make sure that your spouse and children are included on the I-140, but all of the PERM and the I-140 are the employer's uh, documents to file. Um, you may be asked to pay for the application for residency. That's okay. You cannot pay for the PERM. Um, you'll have to get a medical exam and you'll have to attend the interview. Typically, the company is not required to attend the interview. Um, sometimes you get lucky and there is no interview. That's the best. Um, you're not allowed to sign the PERM or the I-140. You can't do this for yourself. You can't be involved in the recruitment process um, and you can't pay for the perm in particular, the attorney's fees um, or any of that recruitment fees for advertising. Um, all right, and I know I need to get moving on, so I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly. Um, but the EB2 it, with a national interest waiver is uh, one of the options for self-petitioning. Um, if you have an advanced degree, so that would be master's plus or a bachelor's degree plus five, or we can meet the criteria for exceptional ability, and you're working in an area of substantial merit and national interest, then you may be able to file your own petition. So I've done this for people researching pharmaceuticals, people providing uh, managing the mining safety. I've done this for engineers, um, you know, people in the medical field. Um, you have to look at areas that are going to prospectively benefit the United States. Um, so that may be pretty broad, but it has to have a national impact. Um, this is nice because, you know, you may or may not have an actual job offer, but you can do this for yourself. Um, so this is awesome if you're able to, to meet all of the criteria. Um, it can be sponsored by an employer, but does not have to be. Um, EB1A uh, is extraordinary ability in basically any field, um, but it does require sustained national acclaim. And then you have to meet several evidentiary criteria, like a major international award or lesser awards, plus recognition in newspapers and journals. Um, you know, so that's something that it would be difficult to meet through your job. But if you happen to also be an athlete or a world renowned artist, maybe you're not gonna end up doing something through your degree. You're gonna fall back on something that you've been doing for the past 20 years anyway, in order to get your residency in the US. Um, you still have to be planning to work in the field of extraordinary ability. Um, EB-5 is the investor visa. You have to have at least $900,000 to invest in, an air, in, a, in a project in the U.S. Um, you can create your own business or you can invest in, in certain businesses that have been approved. Um, most of us don't have that, but if you do, there, there are some specialized attorneys that work in that area. All right, so we've got some country specific options. I wanted to note um, if you are from Canada or Mexico and looking at some specific, um, this isn't for all professionals, it's just for professionals in certain designated fields. 
but these are employer sponsored um, petitions that allow you to work in, in those fields in the United States. And it's easier to get a TN than it is to get an H-1B. There's no limit on the number of people eligible for a TN. Um, so, you know, this is an option if you're from Canada or Mexico, you wanna take a look and see whether you could be a TN instead of an H-1B. Um, H-1B1 um, is a little bit easier to go through. We have special agreements with Singapore and Chile for those. Um, E3 is a specialty occupation. It's very similar to H-1B, but there aren't any limits on the number of these available. And these are just for Australians. Um, and there's kind of an abbreviated process for an E3. So those are pretty awesome. Um, E1, Treaty Trader, and E2 would allow you to start your own business in the United States um, or continue operating a business if you already have one. Um, and these are just for people from specific countries that we have treaties with. So we do have treaties with Canada. We have treaties with the UK, for example. We don't have treaties with Brazil. Uh, we don't have treaty with Iran. So there are some countries that, that can benefit from an E1 or an E2 um, the investment required for the E2 is a lot less than the EB5 we talked about. Um, and as I mentioned, these are all temporary visas that are available for people from specific countries. This is not for permanent residents necessarily. Um, or it's not for permanent residents, but there may be options to move on to permanent residents. Other temporary options. You know, you could say, hey, if I'm not, if I don't get selected in the H-1B lottery, I'm going to go get my master's degree. Going back to school is a, a very valid, solid option for many people. Um, O-1 is for individuals with extraordinary ability, but this is the non-immigrant uh, temporary type of visa. Um, P-1s are for international athletes of extraordinary ability and entertainers with an international reputation. Um, L1s sometimes work out. Those are for um, companies that have branches in the US and abroad. And you could make an agreement with an international company to go work abroad for at least a year. And then they can transfer you back to the United States as an L1 if you're a manager, an executive, or you work in an area of specialized knowledge. So sometimes that works better than an H-1B. You just agree to go back to work at the foreign branch for a year or a year and, you know, at least a year, and then they transfer you back. All right, so family-based options. Um, you may, you know, family-based options sometimes are better options than the employment-based options. A lot of people come to me and say, um, hey, I really, really want to do this on my own. I want to do this through work. However, I'm about to get married to a US citizen. You know, is there any way I can do this through employment? And my answer usually is, <laughs> well, we could do this through employment, but there's, it's really complicated. It's going to take a lot longer. If you're about to marry a US citizen, let's do this the easy way. Um, you know, so it's important that you're only marrying a US citizen for because you want to spend the life with that person. There are severe penalties for marriage fraud. I would never suggest marrying someone just for immigration status, but it may be a good way if you are already dating and engaged to someone. This may be a way to, to become a resident um, that is a lot easier than all the employment based pathways. Um, other family members can petition to you, US citizen children. Parents can petition for their children in certain circumstances. Siblings can petition. Um, a lot of times there's a long wait for siblings to petition for their, for their siblings. Um, so the, the length of the wait depends on the relationship um, and where you're from. Okay, because as I mentioned, some countries send a lot of people to the US, so we have longer waits. All right, so Takeaways, I would take full advantage of the resources that CU has to offer. You wanna research options and different pathways early. So you, you're not just thinking about the typical OPT, H1B, but if you have any other options that you're, you're working those into your plans or alternatives, um, explore options with an open mind. 
you know, you come to me and say, I don't want to do this through my US citizen spouse, and I'm refusing to do it that way. Well, it may result in a pretty significant separation um, or spending a lot of extra money or a lot of additional heartache. So I would explore your options with an open mind or, you know, maybe you have the possibility to go work abroad for a year. Maybe you should do that. It, it may be a, a stronger pathway to go through an L visa than to try to stay here, try to stay here and refuse to go, go abroad for a year. Get personalized legal advice and work flexibility into your plans. Um, so we've got resources for the CU. Uh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association has a find a lawyer function. Um, so that's one place to check and make sure that you're getting a specialized immigration attorney when you're researching your options. Um, US Citizenship and Immigration Services also has a website that has lots of information. And then I have my contact information. You're welcome to reach out to me if you have questions. Um, if it's uh, specific questions, then we may need to about your about your status or you want to explore your options. We may need to set a time for a consultation. And I think I forgot to stop for questions, but I am willing to answer questions now. I think we got through all the material that I have for you and, and I'm available for that. Thanks, Kristen. Um, yeah, sorry, I know you had so much good information. So there were some questions that came in. Um, I can try to try to post them to you here now. Um, I'm also getting a message that my internet connection is a little bit unstable. So I may ask another ISSS person to tap in if I, if I lose connection for any reason. Um, but the, the first question is, as a Canadian national, will it be easier to find one of the mentioned visas without the help of the employer? And this came in kind of when you were speaking about um, H-1Bs. So, um, you know, I don't know if it's about special H-1B considerations for, for Canadians. Okay. Um, well, so there are a few options for Canadians um, and a few things about being Canadian that makes it a bit easier. Uh, Canadians don't need an actual visa in your passport for certain types of immigration statuses. So H-1B is one of those. Um, you, you do need an employer to sponsor you for an H-1B. You do, if it's cap subject, you're going to be placed in the lottery. But if you get approved for an H-1B, then you don't need an actual visa. You can get a visa stamp by presenting the approval notice. Um, so that's really nice for Canadians. It just takes out one of the steps in the process. Um, Canadians also are eligible for TNs. Um, and TNs are for individuals in certain professional occupations. And there's a list of professional occupations that qualify along with each occupation has what type of degree is required or how much experience is required to qualify. Um, and so if you fit into one of those categories and the job fits into one of those categories, like accountant, for example, is a job that qualifies, um, computer systems engineer qualifies. Um, so if, if you fit into one of those categories, TNs are, there's no limit on them. You can uh, present that application at the border um, or at the airport. Um, and so those are much easier to get and they're valid for up to three years as well. And you can get an unlimited number of renewals on those. So there are some specific options for Canadians that are easier. Um, Canadians, there's also a treaty between the US and Canada. So uh, E2 investment visas are opportunities to start your own business in the US. Um, and we're looking at investments as low as let's say 30 to 50,000, but it could be higher than that, depending on the type of business. Thank you. Um, so this next question, um, it looks like this person might be on an H4, but you know, my father's on an H1B visa and I'm about to be aged out. Um, can visa dependent students apply for the H1B cap? And does this process look different for a visa dependent student? Okay, um, 
Yeah, so if you have never been an H-1B yourself, you can certainly have a company petition for you. Um, and then it, it would just depend on, you know, how long that H-4 is valid. It's going to end when you turn 21. Um, so you need to make plans prior to that to get on your own independent visa or your own independent status, whether that be an F-1 student status um, or you're able to get an H-1B. Um, if you don't, then you'll be out of status and you may need to leave and, and come back. Thank you. Um, these next two also, I believe, came in when you were speaking about H-1Bs. So I'm just going to ask them together. Um, let's see, does graduate school only have to be a public institution? And also clarification on where does the doctoral degree fall under the H-1B filing? Okay. Yeah, so the benefit of um, getting a U.S. master's or doctorate, so it's master's plus, when I say the master's cap qualifies, um, is that you have some additional visas available to you under the cap, so you have a better chance of getting selected in the lottery. Um, and yeah, it does have to be either a public or a private nonprofit institution. It has to be a public nonprofit institution to qualify um, for the exemption for the master's degree. So private universities that are for profit don't qualify. Um, so that's something we can look up if you have questions about it, um, you know, about a university that you attended, whether that degree is going to count for the CAP. Um, let's see the question. Let's see. There's a question here about, I think when you were posting the bulletin, mm -hmm. so it says, how do you read the dates of the bulletin example? 08 August 15. Okay. Yeah, it is confusing. 08 is the day. Um, AUG is August, right? And then 15 is the year. So it's day, month, year. And essentially, you would have had to file either the, well, the company would have had to file the PERM, um, the date of filing the PERM, or the date that the I-140 is filed, if there's no PERM, is the priority date. And so in order to be current, you have to have filed that PERM or I-140 prior to the date. So if it's 08 August 15, your application would have had to have been filed to establish a priority date before August 8th of 2015 to be current next month. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm sure that's a question that others had too. So um, let's see. There's a question here about how long the process usually takes. Um, oops, sorry, my questions are getting kind of moved around. How long the process usually takes um, when uh, about the green card process, I think, to a US citizen? Um, so it really depends on which process you're going through and also when you're doing it. <laughs> Right now there are significant delays at USCIS. And so it's actually hard for me to give good estimates, um, but the process is very, if you, if you marry a US citizen, um, then it probably takes about a year to become a resident from application to approval, assuming it gets approved. And then within three years, you can, after three years, you can file for naturalization to become a US citizen. If you do it through employment, the PERM process typically takes about two years, just as an estimate, to go through all of the steps we talked about. Um, sometimes it takes longer than that. So, and then once you become a resident and get your green card, you have to wait five years to apply for citizenship. So it really depends on what process you're going through. Thank you. Um, let's see. So if a, somebody's uncle is a green card holder, um, can the uncle sponsor their visa? 
Um, okay, so uncles who are residents are not relatives that qualified to petition for you. Um, an uncle who is a US citizen could petition for your parent. And only if you're under 21 would you be included in that. Gotcha, thank you. Um, okay, just moving along down the line here. Um, does having a minor degree work for any of these op options um, since the minor is different than a major? Um, I think typically you're looking at your major when they're looking at like the bachelor's degree and whether it's tied to the, the field of specialization, like your bachelor's degree in nutrition and food science, for example, does that match up with the position that you are applying for? But it really depends on what you're trying to do as well. So, it, you know, I assume that was for H1B, but um, maybe you'd be qualified for a PERM position based on how the employer defines it um, with a minor. All right, um, let's see. So we have about four more questions here right now. Is the H-1B minimum wage set for all majors or is it specific depending on the profession? So the H-1B prevailing wages are based on the position that you're going to fill. So it's not based on your degree, it's based on the position description. Um, prevailing wages are set by the government. You look at the classification of the job. So the generic federal classification, they basically have divided up jobs into different types of occupations. Um, you figure out what is this position closest to on the federal list. And then you look at the wages for your area and there's different levels based on whether it's an entry level position um, or a position with a little bit more experience required um, or a position with significant supervisory authority. Um, and so those are set by the government based on the position that you're going to be filling. Okay, um, let's see. This question is, can you please clarify the H-1B situation for Canadian citizens? And does this also apply to permanent residents? Um, okay, well, I think I, I talked about Canadians a, a little bit. I'm not sure what the situation, what you mean by that. Um, you still need an employer to petition for you. Um, you know, if you're here as a student, a Canadian student, and the employer petitions for you, and you've done everything you're supposed to do, you could just change your status if it's approved, and you would start working as an H-1B. The difference for Canadians is that you don't need the actual visa. So if you travel abroad, let's say you go back to Canada to visit your family while you're working on your H-1B, you don't need to apply for a visa and go to an interview at the US consulate in Canada, get a visa placed in your passport. You could get the visa stamp at the border instead. You're visa exempt for, for H-1Bs. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, how long does it take for the H1, eight, sorry, how long does it take for an H4 visa holder to get a work permit? And is there any benefit for the H4 visa holder in terms of fees for their master's degree? Okay, an H4 is uh, the dependent status for an H1B. So if you're the spouse of someone who has an H1B, then you are an H4. You don't automatically get permission to work as an H4. You can get permission to work if the H1B a principal also has an approved I-140 that's pending, that's, you know, um, um, with USCIS, okay? So that means the employer has decided to sponsor this person for permanent residency as well. 
at that point, you're able to apply for your work authorization. Um, as far as a benefit, you know, if you're, if the principal is not able for some reason to gain permanent residency, um, then you could both lose out. So it's great if both individuals in the relationship are professionals. You know, if, if your spouse runs out of H-1B time and doesn't get permanent residency and you get your master's degree and you get sponsored, then you could become the principal H-1 and your spouse can now be an H-4. And I think the second question, I'm just kind of like re-looking at that from that individual, it might have actually been a question related to like to tuition classification oh. at the university. And so for the um, person who, who posed that, um, I would just direct you to talk to your ISSS specialist on that one to get some you know, more information. Okay. Um, so thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then the last question we have here is, are there any options to apply for PERM green card while you're on CPT? To apply for a green card while you're on CPT? If, if you have a company yeah. that is willing to sponsor you and you qualify for the position that they want to sponsor you for, um, then the company can start working on that process at any time. Um, even while you're on CPT. Um, you're not going to be able to work for the company who's filing a perm and doing an I-140 just because they started that process for you. You would need you know, CPT authorization to work for the company, OPT authorization to work for the company. Um, you're not allowed to work for that company based on the perm process only until you get your green card. So you hopefully you have an underlying OPT, H-1B, other status that you're allowed to work for the company on. Great, thank you. And then if there are further questions about CPT, um, you know, please just encourage, I encourage who, if anybody has those questions to, to definitely speak with your ISSS specialist um, or DSO as Kristen was talking about earlier in the presentation that um, your ISSS specialists are DSOs. So um, I think that's it. Um, I think all of our questions have been answered. Um, you know, I know it's a few minutes before 1.30. If there's any lingering things, um, you know, I guess feel free to pop in the chat right now. But in the meantime, you know, thank you so, so much, Kristen, for the presentation and, and sharing your, um, your knowledge and answering these questions on the fly. And um, for all, all, all the participants, I think you, you may be aware of this already because I think it's been mentioned a few times, but this recording will be available for you to look back on if you, you know, want to reference anything. It will be up on the OAA ISSS website and I believe the link was shared. Um, as well and here, here it is again so um, please do expect to see that probably not immediately but within like a few hours so um, you know thank you again Kristen um, we are so appreciative and thank you all for the attendees also for for you know taking advantage of of this time so um, I think thank I you. think that's a wrap <laughs> thank you it was it was a pleasure and let me know if you have any questions follow up Okay. Uh, my, my contact information was posted for quite a while there. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so, so much. And um, I hope everybody has a really wonderful day. Um, we'll be closing out this. I'm just going to.